Thank you. Uh, so if you look at your Bibles, turn to, uh, well, look at uh, verse number four there. First John chapter three and verse number four. The Bible reads, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. The title for the sermon tonight is The Destructive Nature of Sin. The Destructive Nature of Sin. So it's important to, to preach on this topic because, you know, a, a lot of the Christian life you've got to, is all about finding the right balance. A lot of your Christian living is all about finding the balance. You don't want to go too extreme on one end and you don't want to go too extreme on the other end. And when it comes to this topic of sin, there's a great realization, you know, that hits you hard sometimes after you're saved, after you realize you've been delivered, is that I'm going to sin for the rest of my life, all right? And you can kind of take, uh, like I said, two extreme views, maybe on one side where, where the believer realizes, man, I'm, I've gone back to my old sins. I, I once was zealous. I wanted to serve God. I, I wanted to do what's right. And I'm just finding myself back in, in my old sins. Uh, I'm still finding pleasure in those sins that I used to do. Or maybe even newer sins that they weren't doing before. You know, they find themselves doing it uh, as a saved man. And one extreme position, which is incorrect, is to say, you know, woe is me, a sinner, and oh man, how can God use me? I can't do anything for the Lord. And you just beat yourself down and you stay in a depressed attitude, a depressed mood. And, you know, you're just, you're just so sorry for yourself, you know. And, and because you're in that state, you don't actually do any work for God. Okay, that would be unbalanced. Okay, because the realization that hits you is that I'm going to sin for the rest of my life till the day I die. And then the person over here on the other extreme will say, well, since, you know, I, I, I'm just going to serve the Lord, praise God, I'm going to do what God says that I'm going to do. Uh, and because I'm going to sin for the rest of my life, I'm just going to continue in sin. And I'm just not going to give it a second thought because I just, you know, I, what's the point? I'm going to sin to the day I die. I might as well just enjoy my sin. I might as well just keep sinning. And they've got no concern about trying to change their life, right? They're not cast down, but they're on a different uh, level of extreme and they don't care about overcoming the sins in their life. Because, hey, praise God, I'm saved. Jesus died for my sins. Hey, it makes no difference if I overcome sins in my life. I'm still going to heaven. Praise God. No, but here's a, here's a realization that we need to be balanced. You know, that is extreme. That is extreme. And we need to have a balanced view. So many, a lot of my sermons, I went back to look at, look at my sermons that I've preached over the, over the time, you know, the months and the years. And if, whenever I preach on sin, I've kind of preached more about this person. And I'm like, hey, you've got to, you know, put your past behind you. You've got to just realize that you're a sinner. Pick yourself up. Go confess those sins to the Lord and be useful for God and do something productive. You know, I'm usually preaching to this guy here. Okay. But this sermon is more about this guy over here. The guy that's just gotten comfortable with his sins. He just says, well, I'm saved anyway. I'm going to heaven anyway. So why should I make any effort to try to have victory over my sins in my daily Christian life? So that, the sermon's for this guy. All right. And it's all about getting you back over here. Not over here. Not over there, but right where God needs it to be, okay? So the destructive nature of sin. And the only way you can get out, away from this is when you wake up and you realize, man, sin is horrible. You know, sin is destroying my life. And as I said, the title for the sermon tonight is The Destructive Nature of Sin. Now, when you look at verse number four there, it says, Whosoever commit of sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is, so it's going to define sin, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, the word is in the English language, it's kind of like this verb. And you can almost use it when you think about mathematics, it's, almost, it's, it's kind of like the equal sign. So you could so, kind of say, for sin equals the transgression of the law. Okay? But you can also say it, you know, if, if you put it in, in that sense in mathematics, you can also say it the other way around. You can also say the transgression of the law equals sin. Right? Both of those statements are true. And uh, you know, that's kind of like saying, well, you know, uh, Christian's father is Kevin. But you can also say Kevin, Kevin is Christian's father. Okay? Or you, know, you, can, you can use is in that sense where you can reverse it and they're both true. Because okay? it's kind of like saying this equals that. It doesn't matter which way you put it. Uh, they're, they're both saying the same thing. Or you might say you know, 5 plus 4 equals 9. All right? 5 plus 4 equals 9. Or you might say 5 plus 4 is 9. Is or equals. You know, these things can be used interchangeably. Or you could say 9 is 5 plus 4. That would be true as well, right? Nine is five plus four. Uh, so this is important as we go through some of these passages because there's a few verses, and I, I didn't take all, all the passages in the Bible, but there are many verses that say sin is something, but then you could also say it the other way around. That is sin, okay? So this is important for you to sort of understand the destructive nature of sin. 
Now, the first point that I have here is that sin makes you deserving of hell. Okay, point number one, sin makes you deserving of hell. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, right? And Revelation 21.8, we know these verses so well because we use these often when you're preaching the gospel. Revelation 21.8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, please go to John chapter 3 for me. Go to John chapter 3. One thing I want you to understand is that sin makes you deserving of hell. But sin does not send you to hell. It just makes you deserving of hell. Okay? Because here's the thing. You still sin today. You still sin today. And you're going to sin tomorrow. And that sin makes you deserving of hell. Even if you're saved. Even if you're saved. Even if you believed on Christ, your sin still makes you deserving of hell. And this is where we get the doctrine of God's grace, because grace is unmerited favor. Okay? You deserve hell, but because of God's grace, he's not going to cast you into hell. Because of God's grace, he sent Jesus Christ to be your substitute, that he would die in your place so you can go free. Okay? So believing on Jesus does not make you any less deserving of hell, it just makes you saved. It takes you saved from hell. And actually look at John chapter 3, verse 18. What is it that sends someone to hell? It's John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So sin makes us deserving of hell, but what sends us to hell is not believing on Jesus Christ. Okay? Look at the last uh, verse in John 3, John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And there's no greater wrath of God than being cast into hellfire for all eternity, right? So we see that it's actually not believing the gospel, not believing on Jesus Christ, that actually sends us to hell. Because we all have sin, and we all deserve to sin. Those that believe in Jesus deserve to go to hell. Those that don't believe in Jesus deserve to go to hell. But we don't go to hell because we have believed on Jesus and we've received the grace of God. Okay, undeserved favor or undeserved merit. Now, another passage that I want to turn, uh, well, actually, you don't need to turn there. If you want to go to James chapter 2, go to James chapter 2 for me. And I'll, I'll read to you from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. Because not only does sin make you deserving of hell, but sin also determines the severity of pain in hell. The ones that have sinned the greatest and the most, those that have been the most wicked, those that have been reprobate before even going to hell, are going to suffer the most in the fires of hell. Yeah. This is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. This is to do with our resurrection. This has to do with our bodily resurrection, the rapture. But we may miss, I think I've missed this point when I've covered 1 Corinthians 15 uh, before. But it says in verse 54, For when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, that's how our corruptible bodies have our incorruptible bodies, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now it says this, in verse number 55, O death, where is thy sting? So because we've been saved, and not only saved, we've got those new resurrected bodies, we can say to the power of death, we can say to death, where is your sting? Where is your pain? It doesn't hurt me anymore because... I'm fully saved, not just spiritually, but physically in those new bodies, and I'm with Christ. So you can see that there is a sting to, in death. And of course, sting is a reference to something that is painful. And then it says, O grave, where is thy victory? Verse number 56, the sting of death is sin. Okay? And the strength of sin is the law. Okay? So notice that the sting of death is sin. So how much sin you take with you to hellfire will determine how bad that sting is. And then it says, and the strength of sin is the law. So, of course, sin is a transgression of the law. So those that have transgressed the law of God the most will face the harshest sting, will take, take the harshest pain in the lowest hells. Okay, so uh, that's just the reality. You know, sin makes us deserving of hell. And it also, for those that do not believe on Christ, also uh, uh, determines how much they're going to be in pain in, in the fires of hell. All right, so sin makes you deserving of hell. Point number two, you guys have turned to James chapter 2, verse 10. Sin makes you guilty. 
You know, sin, sin ought to make you guilty. You know, feel guilty, yeah, maybe, but some, even if you don't feel guilty, you are guilty, right? I mean, there are times that I've sped, right? I've broken the law and, I, and I've gotten a fine, right? And I don't feel guilty. It's like, come on, it's just, you know, five kilometers over the limit. But I was guilty. I, I did break the law, right? And this is James chapter 2, and 2 verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So there's the transgression of the law again. Not only have you transgressed the law, but your label or your title is a transgressor of the law. But as it said there in verse number 10, he is guilty of all. You commit one sin, you've broken the laws of God. The whole thing. The whole thing, you, you failed. You failed at keeping the whole thing. So, you know, you might say, I'm striving to live right. I'm striving to do this. And especially as an unsaved person, they're trying to live godly. You know, just one lie makes them guilty of the entire law. Makes them a transgressor in the eyes of God. And this is why we, of course, need the grace of God. And so, you know, understanding sin and understanding the destructive nature of sin also helps us understand the love of God. Helps us understand the grace and the mercy of God because we've transgressed against Him. And when someone transgresses against me, I want to see that person get punished. <laughs> I want to see that person, right, get the full measure of judgment for transgressing against me. And yet God is different. You know, He says, no, you know what? That's something that I don't enjoy in. I'd rather see these people saved. I'm willing to send my son because I love the world. And it's just an amazing, amazing love that God has. You know, it's beyond what we can sort of express in ourselves. You know, it's so amazing to think about what Christ has done for us. Now, please go to Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. Because sin ought to make you feel guilty, you know that? And if you, if, you, if you commit sin and you don't feel guilty about it, there's something wrong with your heart. You know, especially as a saved person, you have the Holy Ghost in you, you've got the new man. When you sin, there ought to be a prompting in you that says, oh, I messed up. I, you know, I failed God once again. I'm guilty for what I did, all right? And here's the situation in Proverbs 21 verse 4, and this is my third point. <clears throat> you know, sin makes you proud. You know, if you're not quick to confess it, if you're not quick to go and get it right with God, you're going to start just making excuses. You're, you're going to stop going to the Lord and confessing those uh, sins, and you're just going to be proud. Proverbs 21 verse 4 says, And high look, and a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. So remember how we can put it the other way around? Sin is a high look. Sin is a proud heart. Sin is the plowing of the wicked. When it says that the plowing of the, of the wicked, it's not that plowing, you know, uh, uh, plowing seeds and, and growing a harvest is sinful, but because these are wicked people, and you see the context of, of, uh, of being pr uh, proud in heart and having that high look, it's because someone that has sinned against the Lord, a wicked person who has no regard for the Lord, when they are productive, when they do go and, and, and harvest, they will account that for themselves. They'll say, well, look what I have done. And they won't acknowledge, they won't give thanksgiving to God for the seed, for the rain, for the soil. They won't give thanks to God. They will just boast of themselves. And so sin makes you proud. And when you refuse to go to the Lord, and when you refuse to, to be guilty before the Lord, I'm talking about someone that's saved now, okay? And you just want to, you need to have that sweet fellowship with God. You're going to get hardened in the heart. You're going to have pride in your heart and say, well, God, I'm a sinner anyway. I'm going to sin till the day I die. Um, you know, so what, who cares, Lord? And, and you have this attitude of making excuses for your sins when really you should just be guilty, you should just lower your eyes in, in, a, in, a, in the face of a righteous God and say, God, please help me be humble. Help me to get this sin out of my life. I don't want to be someone that's a wicked person that plows and praises myself. No, Lord, I want to be someone that if I plow and I'm productive, that I'm, I'm recognizing you, I'm giving you thanks because I am sinful, because I am weak. The only reason I can be productive is because of your hand, your hand of provision, because of your hand of grace. And so sin makes you proud, okay? And, you know, don't have this attitude that I can just serve God and I'm going to sin for the rest of my life. Who cares? Well, you're going you're to become a very proud person, a very prideful person. Now, um, I won't get you to turn here, but Romans 14 verse 22, 
My next point, sin makes you faithless. Sin will hurt your faith in the Lord. Okay? Sin makes you faithless. The Bible says in Romans 14, 22, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eats, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So again, just think about it the other way around. Sin is that which is not of faith. Whatsoever is not of faith. Okay, Sin is whatsoever is not of faith. So when you're in a state of sin, and you're, you know, and, and this, is the, this is the reality of, of, of sinning, you have, at that point in time when you've committed that sin, you've been faithless toward God. You say, God, I know this is wrong, but it gives me enjoyment. It, uh, it's something that I want to do. My old man wants to do it. The flesh delights in it, Lord. I know it's breaking your, your, your commandments. Hey, but I'm saved. And you're lacking the faith to acknowledge and to understand that you're trespassing against the Lord God, your, the creator of all things, who's given you life, who's given you salvation, who's given you the word of God, who's given you the blessings on this earth and blessings in heaven. And you forget that for that brief moment of time. And you say, yes, even though I know it's wrong, I'm going to do it anyway. Hey, that's a, a lack of faith. And again, you continue down that road, you're going to find yourself with less and less faith. You know, when you read this book, you're going to uh, not be able to believe or understand and, and appreciate the beautiful words of God, you know, which are more precious than gold. And you're not going to be able to you know, receive those things in faith. You know, our Christian life is all about going from faith to faith. We do things faithfully, following the commandments of God, knowing that if I do what God says that I need to do, that I'm going to be right with Him, that He's going to bless me, that I'm not going to destroy my life. And when you lack the faith, well, that's when you start to destroy your life because you don't have the faith that what God's Word says is true. And you start living however you think you need to live. You know, faith makes you, sorry, sin makes you faithless. How can you pray without faith? How can you go to the Lord without faith? You know, you continue down that rabbit hole of sin, it's going to hurt your faith. You're in, you're in Proverbs. Please go to Psalm 51. Go to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Sin makes you feel dirty. Sin makes you feel dirty. That's my next point. Okay. I mean, have you ever been filthy? And you just, you just, you know, maybe you've, you've worked hard, you've sweated, maybe you've gotten messy and, you know, you just, you can't wait to get into that shower. I mean, just today, just before church, I couldn't wait to just have a shower, you know, just, just to be clean and come to church and have a little bit of a shave and just be fresh, you know. Well, sin makes you feel dirty like that, like you do on the outside, wanting that shower. It, that's, it makes you feel dirty on the inside. Look at Psalm 51, verse 2. Psalm 51, verse number 2. This is a Psalm of David, which um, he, he wrote after committing adultery with Bathsheba. But then he says in verse number 2, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. How did David feel after he was, you know, called out for the sin that he committed of adultery? He felt dirty. He felt unclean this whole time, right? And, and now he says, look, God, just wash me. Can you clean me? I need a shower. I need to be washed. In fact, some sins that you do in the body, you may just feel like, I need to have a shower, all right? Just to feel like you've been cleansed, but it's only a bodily cleanse and you're still filthy on the inside. You know, the Lord you know, wants you to come to Him to be clean, uh, clean, to be clean. It feels so good to be clean, right? It feels so good to have a shower, put on some fresh clothes, you know, a, a, bef instead of just stinking up the place, right? Sin makes you feel dirty. It's going to have that effect on your life. Uh, look, at some, look at verse number 7, same, same uh, psalm. Psalm 51, verse number 7. He says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So he mentions it twice in this passage. David's like, I'm so dirty, Lord. I can't get this off me. Can you clean me? Can you wash me, Lord? He's asking for forgiveness. He's, he's finally bringing himself down in humility and saying, God, I, I've messed up. I need to be washed. I need to be clean. 
You know, and this man's already saved. This man's already saved. But even as a saved person, if you find yourself constantly in sin, you're going to just feel that dirty. You're not going to you're not going to enjoy life, okay? You're not going to be able to appreciate life because you just have that filthiness in you. Please go to John 13. John 13, verse number 3. And when it comes to this topic, John 13 is one of my favorite passages dealing with this topic. John 13, and this is, of course, Jesus um, at, the, uh, at the Last Supper. Jesus at the Last Supper. John 13, verse number 3, says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. So this is the story. After the supper, he gets ready to wash his disciples' feet. All right? And don't miss the spiritual lesson in the story, okay? Yes, this is about the need to serve one another. Absolutely. Don't forget that. But at the same time, there's a greater spiritual truth in this. And it says in verse number five, After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now. See, what he's saying is, you don't get what I'm doing. Look, if this was just to wash his feet, just to be a servant, why would Jesus say, look, you don't really get what I'm doing right now? There's a, there's a greater spiritual truth is what Jesus is telling Simon Peter. Okay? What, I do, uh, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. So you'll understand it in due time. Verse number eight, Peter saith unto him, thou shalt never wash my feet. Okay, so I can understand Peter. I mean, if Jesus walked in these doors right now and, you know, he wanted to wash your feet, you'd probably be like, Lord, why? Let me wash your feet. <laughs> let, let me get down, Lord, and get some water and, and a towel and I'll wash your feet, Lord. You know, you, it'll be uncomfortable to think, you know, that Jesus Christ would come and wash your feet. So I can understand Peter. I can understand Peter's reaction here. And then he, uh, what Jesus, his, Jesus answered, verse number eight, Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. No part. You, you either let me wash your feet, Peter, or you've got, I, I can't have anything to do with you. I, I can't be around you. That's what Jesus is saying, right? Verse number nine. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So you can see how he reacts, right? This is what, this is what I'm talking about. The Christian life, you need a balance. All right? The right thing is for Jesus to wash your feet. When you're saved, you need your feet washed. Peter's like a little bit unbalanced, going, look, just wash it all from top to bottom. But that's not what Jesus needed to do for him. Jesus just needed to wash his feet. Look at verse number 10. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not. So if you're wa washed, you don't need to be washed again. Right? Not. Save or accept to wash his feet. But is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So what's the lesson here? He says, like, you're all clean except one. And that one, of course, was Judas Iscariot. Okay? So when he says you're all clean, he's referring to the fact that they're saved, that they believe on Jesus Christ. Understand that? But even those that are saved and believed on Jesus Christ, yes, they've been washed from top to bottom, but they still needed their feet cleaned. They still needed their feet washed. Okay? So this is a picture of our lives. We're clean. We're washed top to bottom, once saved, always saved. You don't need to be cleaned again. Okay, it's been done, but our feet represent our life. We go about, like our feet represent even soul winning, right? Your soul win talks about your beautiful feet. You get out there, you do the works of God. Hey, you can, you can have beautiful feet as you serve the Lord and you preach the gospel, but you can also have very filthy feet because you're going to sin for the rest of your life. You're going to sin till the day that you die. And as you go about life, you're going to be accumulating more and more dirt on your feet. And if you're here and you're like, well, God, you know, I, I want to serve you, Lord. I want to go so winning. I want to be in church. But you have all, you've gathered, your feet are dirty, you're filthy. With all your sins, you've not confessed them. You've not gone to the Lord to be cleaned. Well, what did Jesus say? Jay, say? That you have no part with him. You can't have fellowship with the Lord. You know, and I don't want your faith, I don't want your Christianity to be, be all in vain. You know, where, you're, where on the outward, everyone thinks you're right with God. Everyone sees your work, that you're trying to serve the Lord, but you've 
got your feet dirty. Your feet are dirty and you need to get them cleaned. And the reason you've not gone to confess your sins is because you're like Peter. All right. What did he say again? Thou shalt never wash my feet, said Peter. Well, don't stay there. Learn the lesson. Okay, because if you never have your feet washed, you can't have sweet fellowship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can't use you for his service. Okay. Everything else that you do, if you're, not, if you're not doing it with Christ, if you're not doing it in the new man, it's just vain. It's, it's all vanity. It's just vain attending church. It's got no purpose. There's, there's no re- it doesn't help you unless you're, you've got clean feet, unless you've got a clean heart. So that's why I'm saying it's so important. Yeah, you know, yeah, woohoo, I'm going to serve God, but I, whatever, who cares? My sins, I, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to put up, I'm going to keep sinning because I know I'll never overcome it. It's a wrong attitude to have because then you have no part with Jesus Christ. And I know the reason you want to serve God is because you want to be with Christ. Because you want to be with the Lord. You want to fellowship with God. And so it's so important that you realize what sin does to your life. Yes, we know about the unsaved and they're deserving of hell and you're not going to go to hell. Praise God. But while you live this earth, these 70, 80, 90, 100 years that you have, I want you to be with Jesus Christ. I want you to be in fellowship with Christ. I want you to be as productive as you can as you serve God in your life. And so you have to understand just how filthy sin is, even in our day-to-day life. How Jesus says, look, I've got to wash your feet. And look, Jesus was willing to wash his feet. Praise God that we have a God who's willing to do that. It's amazing to think that we can go to, to God and say, God, please forgive me. Please cleanse me. Please wash me. It's so important to preach this. I don't know why a lot of churches don't preach on this. I, I don't get it. It's so important. You miss this part, you're kind of just spinning your wheels for the Lord. You know, it's so important that you go and you confess your sins to the Lord. Now, please go to our... Uh, I'll get to turn to Galatians chapter 6. Go to Galatians chapter 6. What else does sin do for, to your life? You know, sin leaves lasting consequences. You're going to have consequences of your sins. Now, when it comes to maybe the smaller sins, maybe not so much. But significant, serious sins... You know, fornication, adultery, I mean, even drunkenness and, and addiction to hard drugs and things like that can have significant lasting consequences uh, in your life. And uh, the Bible says in Psalm 51, remember this is the same Psalm that David wrote about Bathsheba and asking God for forgiveness. But in verse number three, he says, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He goes, It's. It's like, it's not, he's not saying that God won't forgive him. Of course God will forgive him. But he says, look, the consequences of this, and, and we know that the Lord punished him uh, for that great sin, and his, he, you know, his, his uh, children died certain deaths, and the kingdom was split, and all, all those kinds of things because of his sin. And, uh, but then he says this, yeah, he says, and my sin is ever before me. There are lasting consequences to your sins. You know, and, and uh, you've you got to be careful. Go to you're, you're in Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh, soweth, sorry, flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall the spirit reap reap life everlasting be not deceived god is not mocked when you sin god knows all about it i don't know about it your family might not know about it your friends may not know about it you may think i got away with it nobody found out nobody knows god is not mocked and he's going to bring it up and you'll pay the consequences for it you're going to reap what you sowed. What did it say? For he that soweth to, to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Sin has a lasting consequence on this earth. It can hurt you mentally. It can hurt you emotionally. It leaves scars. You can be, you can be leaving scars in the lives of other people that love you and that care for you. Say, so what do I do, Pastor Kevin? I, I keep sinning. Well, just understand how serious... Let's start there. Let's just understand how serious sin is. You're transgressing the law of God. You know, you, you're, every sin 
You know, even when you've sinned against a brother in the Lord, yes, you've sinned against them, but you've sinned against the Lord as well. Any sin you've committed, you've transgressed against the Lord. You know, you've been an offense toward the Lord God. Start there and just realize, God, I've messed up. I've messed up, Lord. And we know God. We know he's full of wrath. We know he's got that hand of chastisement. And, and uh, we know that, uh, you know, he has to set things right. He has to be a righteous judge. Okay? But you don't want to be stuck in your sins and just wait for the hand of God to bring chastisement in your life. I mean, that's a scary thought to just think, oh, God, how long is it going to take? Just go and confess it. Just go and get your feet washed. Just go and beg for the mercy of God, for the long-suffering that God has, the great love that He has for you, so the chastisement can be a lot lighter, okay? And you can still learn the lesson, because what's, the chast what's chastisement about? It's about profiting you. It's so you can learn, so you can grow, so you can change. But if a lot of the growth and change has already happened, Lord, that was wrong, please forgive me, then His hand of chastisement does not have to be as severe. It's when you're full of pride and you're hardened to the Lord and you don't go to the Lord, you're ashamed, to even face him, then expect his chastisement to be a lot harder. A lot harder because you've hardened yourself toward the Lord. And that leads me to my next point. In Numbers 32 verse 23, you don't need to turn there. It says, but if you will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. This is 100% sure. Okay, Be sure. Your sin will find you out. Listen, you can't hide it forever. My point is that sin will expose you. Sin, one day, you think you're doing fine. You think you're coasting along just fine. Everyone thinks that, you know, you're powering for the Lord and you're having victory over sin and you've got those hidden sins in your life. At some point, you're going to be exposed if you don't go and get those things right with the Lord. If you don't go to the Lord and ask Him for His powerful help to overcome those sins that you have sin will expose you and I, I don't want you you to be we've seen it with the pastor in america didn't we how he lived his double life with prostitutes and gambling and all that okay one that what happened his sin found him out now what he's destroyed his testimony he's destroyed his reputation okay his wife probably doesn't trust him now like she used to, right? I mean, there's, there's destruction, there's lasting consequences, but he's been exposed. He's been exposed and it's just, it's shameful. You know, it's all over the internet, right? These things, you know, it's all over the place and he'll never be able to escape that. That's part of the consequence of his sin. He should have just got it right with the Lord. He should have just admitted to the Lord. He should have just, he just should have got right with the Lord as soon as that temptation came his way, Okay. I don't want you to be like that pastor. And you probably won't. You probably won't be exposed to that level. Of course, pastors, they've got a greater condemnation if they really mess things up. So, you know, I'm preaching to myself as much as you guys because I don't want to, you know, destroy my reputation where all these sins come out. And look, I'm, I'm a sin, sinner. You're a sinner. We sin. And the most important part, again, brethren, is that you go and you get it right with the Lord. All right? Now, the next point that I have, if you can please go to James chapter 4. Go to James chapter 4 in your Bibles. <clears throat> Is that sin makes God seem distant. Okay. If you're right now saying to me, I just, God just seems so far away. I just feel like He's not, I, just, I don't know where He is. Uh, then it's, it's sin. It's, it's personal sin that you have at the moment. That's causing you to feel that way. In Psalm 51, verse 11, it says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. King David felt like, man, this sin with Bathsheba, I'm so far away from it. Where is the presence of the Lord? Is he going to take away the Holy Spirit? I mean, he feels so far from the Lord, and that's what sin does. Okay, because what did Jesus say? You have, you have no part with me if you don't let me wash your feet. So this is the consequence here, King David feeling that way. You're in James chapter 4 and verse number 8. James chapter 4 and verse number 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Hey, that's beautiful, beautiful. Okay? We often preach about that. Draw nigh to God, and God will be closer to you. But if that's true, then the opposite will be true. All right? If you distance, distance yourself from God, if you don't draw nigh to God, well, He's going to be very distant from you. Right? I mean, if, if you want God to be nigh to you, near to you, you've got to go near to Him. 
But if you're not going near to him, you're going the opposite direction, well, God will feel very, very far from, from you. And yeah, his presence may not be felt. You may feel like that you're praying to your ceiling. You know, your ceilings hit the roof and they bounce back down. They're not reaching the Lord. You can't see the hand of God's blessing in your life. It's probably because you have unconfessed sin. You've got some issue. But look at, look at the end of verse number 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So it's impossible for me to overcome this sin that I have. Then why does it say cleanse your hands, you sinners? Purify your hearts. Why is it there if it's impossible to overcome that habitual sin that you've got in your life? Listen, I'm not, I'm not preaching sinless perfection here. I'm not saying that you'll never, ever, you can get to a point where you'll never sin again until you, know, you die or you're the rapture or whatever, right? I'm not saying that. But you must understand just how serious sin is and God wants you to cleanse your hands. He wants your, 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 your hearts to be purified. Double-minded. You know, this is talking about where we sin. We can sin with our hands. We can sin in our body, right? We can sin in our hearts. We can sin in our minds. These are all different places that we can commit sin. And of course, the sins of the mind and the heart, they're the most sneaky ones because no one sees them. At least the ones in your body, people can sort of find out about it, but the ones that are deep down, you know, and buried, well, only God can see them. And God can see them. And that doesn't mean, that's still, God can still expose you. You know, you're still going to, to uh, reap what you sowed, even with those sinful things that you have in your heart, in your mind. Um, you've got to get those things right. You've got to want to be able to overcome sin. Uh, and please go, to, uh, please go to Romans chapter... Wait, let me think about this. Let me, actually, go to Proverbs. Go to Proverbs. I don't want you to turn to every ref- reference, but uh, if you go to Proverbs, I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 8, verse 7. This kind of ties into the point that I mentioned before, where we have no part with God, where your service for God can be in vain. But the next point that I have here is that sin will cause your worship to be in vain. Sin will cause your worship to be in vain. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You know, I've, I've preached this before. And even especially if you're a preacher, if you come up here behind the pulpit and you have an opportunity to preach, if you come in the flesh, you're not going to please God. Cannot please God. Okay? You come with that carnal mind. You come with that enmity, that sin against the Lord. You haven't set those things right. Well, you're not going to... What's the point? Why are, you, why are you preaching then? Right? It's so important. And, uh, you know... Part of the thing, you know, I want, you know, preachers, I've, I've said, let's start using our ties. You know, we didn't start with our ties and, and come dress nice, you know, come. Because I want that to be a reflection of the inside. When you put your tie on in the mirror, you come to preach or you come to song lead, you know, you look at yourself in the mirror and say, well, I look presentable on the outside. I want that to be a reminder, a sharp reminder. I better be right on the inside. Hey, before I get behind the pulpit, before I song lead, before I preach, God, can you please forgive me for what I've done today? I want, to, I want to get into the house of God with a clean heart. You know, please help me to be a service to the brethren. I don't want my worship, I don't want my service to be in vain for you. I want you to have maximum treasures in heaven. I want you to have them all. I want everything you do in this church, anytime you serve the brethren, for God to lay up another gold brick up, up there, right? I, I, I don't want it to be just a waste, you know, just the outward Outward show, just to please men. No, we should desire to please God. Now, did I get to turn to Proverbs? Proverbs, yeah, okay, go to Proverbs 24, verse number 9. Proverbs 29, sorry, 24, verse 9. Because sin will cause you to lose wisdom. Okay, you might be wise right now. You get into some heavy sins. You're going to start finding yourself become very stupid. Okay, you'll cause you to lack wisdom. Proverbs 24, verse 9. The thought of foolishness is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. But I want you to think about that again. The thought of foolishness is sin. That's correct. But wouldn't it just be as correct to say sin is the thought of foolishness? So what I'm trying to say to you, brethren, is when you sin, you are doing foolishly. That's not wisdom. When you break God's commandments, that's not being wise. That's being foolish. 
That's being stupid. You're not going. You're not listening to the Lord. You're not doing what he says when you sin. Hey, it's a thought of foolishness. And the problem there, brethren, again, if you don't get things right with God, you just leave it hanging around, you're going to become stupid. Because foolishness is the opposite of wisdom. And God, you know, the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. Without the fear of God, you're in a sinful place. You're hardened against God. You're in a state of foolishness. And you're going to pick up the Bible and try to read it, and you're not going to get it. It's not going to make sense. The things that you once made sense, you're going to read it again, you're like, why can't I get this? It's because you got foolish. It's because you got stupid. You need the new man, you need the Holy Spirit to empower you to read this book. And when you're stopping the Holy Spirit from doing that, when you're in the carnal flesh, you're going to pick up this book and you go, I, can't, I don't get what's going on there. I got it before, what's going on? It's because you've got unconfessed sin. You've got dirty feet. You know, you've gotten foolish. You've lost the wisdom that God can give you through the Holy Spirit and the new man. And uh, Proverbs, go to 15, verse 15. Uh, sorry, chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 7. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse number 7. It says, The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. Okay, so how important, like I said, a preacher, right? You want to be right with God before you preach because you want to be wise. You want to get here, open the Word of God and uh, disperse knowledge. You want people to learn something from the Word of God. You can only do it if you're right with God. If you're, if you're messed up and you've got sin and you're, you're, not, you're going to be what the foolish, right? But the heart of the foolish doeth not so. You're not going to be able to be a blessing to the church. You're not going to be able to edify the church. Just some other passages. Psalm 73 verse 3 says, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So this psalmist says, look, I'm, I'm covetous. I see how the wicked seem to flourish in this world. But then he says, so he calls them foolish. But then in the same psalm, in verse number 22, he says, so foolish was I and ignorant. And I was as a beast before thee. He says, like, I'm a dumb animal. I've become foolish. I thought they were foolish. And I started to covet after worldliness and, and, and sinfulness and, and, and living ungodly. And I now realize I'm the dumb animal. I'm the foolish one. That's the reality of sin. It makes you a fool. It makes you a stupid animal or a dumb animal. Now, uh, if you can please go to uh, Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Actually, Hebrews. Go to Hebrews 11. Go to Hebrews 11. I try to get you to turn to places where you're not going to have to turn far to, a, to another place. Uh, but Hebrews 11, verse 24. What I want to say here is that sin will cause you to be displeased, discomforted, and unhappy. Displeased, dis discontent, and unhappy. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 says, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. All right, so is there pleasure in sin? Absolutely. That's why you sin. That's why I sin. Because for that brief period of time, it was something we wanted to do. It gave us some type of pleasure. But is it pleasures forevermore? No, it's, 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 it's a pleasure for a season. All right, so you commit the sin, you got a brief moment of pleasure, and now you're miserable. You're not, you're, you, the pleasure's gone. You're displeased. You're unhappy. You're discouraged. That's what sin does. It tricks you. It makes you think if you do it, you'll be pleased. Yeah, for a moment you are, and then it's gone. And now you're displeased. Now you're discontented. Now you're unhappy. Okay? And again, that's kind of the, the extreme that I said about this guy. This Christian, oh man, I'm such a sinner, I can't do anything for God. He's displeased because he's sinned, but he also has, you've got to get up though. Okay, because you've got to live for the Lord. All right, so he's got some of that right attitude. He, he realizes sin is extremely wicked, right, but he's unable to do anything productive for God. And um, I say this because not only does sin cause you to feel that way, discontent, unhappy, and this, without pleasure, is this causes sin to be addictive. Sin is addictive. Why? Because when you did it, it gave you that brief moment of pleasure, and now it's gone. Say, so, but I want that pleasure back. So you go back to the sin. 
and you get that pleasure again. That's gone. What? Well, you go back to that sin because that's and then what? Well, that pleasure's gone now. And, well, and you go back to it becomes addictive. This is like a drug addict. This is like a drunkard, right? For a moment, they take their drugs, they, they take their alcohol, it gives them pleasure for a season, and then it's gone. It's like, oh man, where'd that go? And then they're, well, the only thing that gives me some pleasure is another drink of a beer. And they have another beer. And for a moment, it makes you feel good. In a moment, it gives you a bit of a buzz, it gives you a bit of a high, maybe you're even happy for a brief moment, moment of time. But then, it's gone. Yeah, okay, so that's how these things become addictive. Sin is addictive because there is pleasure, but the pleasure is short-lived. And the only way that you may feel that I can get that pleasure is, again is going back to that same sin over and over and over and over again. Before you're a complete drunkard, before you've, dis- you know, you've destroyed your, your mind mentally with drugs, but even the sins that may not destroy you physically like that, it is destroying you internally. It's destroying you and your relationships. It's destroying your perspective of life and destroying your, your family and, and uh, your relationship with God. It's, it's destroying all these things. And you don't even realize because it's so addictive, you keep going back to those sins over and over again. You know, so sin is addictive. And um, I'll just read to you Psalm 1611. It says, Thou will show me the path of life in thy presence. In the, listen, in the presence of God, in thy presence, is fullness of joy and thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore hey we're all seeking pleasure don't we want to live these lives and be happy don't you want to go to your grave and say man i enjoyed life i'm so thankful i got to live out this period of time you know i I got to enjoy what god has laid out i I got to uh, be happy hey i might not have been rich but i was happy I had joy. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for myself. But you're not going to find that in sin, you're going to find pleasures forevermore at the right hand okay, of God, at the, in the presence of God. Again, what did Jesus say to, to Peter? You don't get your feet washed, you have no part in me. And if you've got no part in Jesus, you've got no part with God, you're not going to have those pleasures forevermore. Okay? This is an eternal pleasure. Of course, we're going to have pleasure in heaven. Okay, forevermore is eternity. But I want it now, don't you? I don't want to wait till I have to go to heaven to be happy for the rest of my life. I want to be happy now. I want to get things right with God and enjoy my life. And face it, yes, God, I'm a sinner. Yes, God, I keep sinning, but I need you. I need you to forgive me, God, because the sin nature, you know all about it since Adam. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just like anybody else. You know, I've got this sin nature, God, and I need you to keep forgiving me. I need you to give me the power to overcome these sins. So in conclusion, brethren, um, I'll get you to turn to, because you're in Hebrews, so go to Hebrews chapter 10 now. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. So this isn't a a sermon about how to overcome sin. That can be for another time. This is a sermon just so you understand the seriousness of your sins. I don't want you to be over here where you're so comfortable in your sins, right? Well, who cares? You know, I'm going to sin anyway. That's a bad place to be. You're unbalanced. You need to get over here. First you start over here. First you get the balance. Then you'll be able to start having victory over those sins. But in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse number 15, it says, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So this covenant is the new covenant. If you've entered that new covenant, this is true for you. Okay, you're saved. Okay, the New Testament. If you're saved, this is true for you. God says, I've written my laws in your hearts and in your minds. Okay? And we know what, what's sin again, the transgression of the law. So the first thing I want you to understand is if you're in touch with the Spirit of God, if you're in the presence of God, you're walking the new man, God doesn't even have to tell you. It's written in your heart. You know what is sinful. In fact, I'll just read another passage. Romans 2.14 says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean 
while accusing or else excusing one another. What Romans 2 is saying is that even the unsaved Gentiles have some of the law of God written in their heart. They understand. They don't necessarily need the Bible to understand what certain, what certain things are right and wrong. But even more so as a believer, as someone that's in the new covenant, in that new man, through the Holy Spirit of God, you're going to know whether what I'm doing here is sinful or whether it's righteous. Okay? What I'm trying to say is you've got to get in touch with your conscience. You've got to get in touch with the Holy Spirit of God. You've got to be in the new man. And so when that temptation comes, it's not just this, oh, I just fall over and I've sinned. It's like the temptation is there and you're like, what you have to understand is if I sin, if I do this sin, I'm a transgressor of God and I'm going to cause him displeasure and I'm going to be unhappy after I do this. You just got to realize that you got to just wake up before you commit that sin. When that temptation comes, say, am I willing to upset the Lord? Am I willing to do what's wrong? Am I willing to just go for that small season of sin? Hey, that's where you start. Just understand that God wants you. You don't, you don't need to be carrying your Bible 24-7. And every time you're tempted, you need to work out, oh, is this right or wrong, God? It's actually reading your heart. It's actually reading your mind. It's an, it's an amazing thing. Okay? But here's what's beautiful about the Bible, okay? Because obviously, if that law is written in our hearts and our minds, it's going to be compatible, it's going to be uh, consistent with what we see in the Word of God. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is a knowledge of sin. So, for we've, so by the law is a knowledge of sin. So here's the thing, and here's what I want you to be thinking about uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, if you are especially struggling with this sin, especially if you're someone that struggles to get right with God when you do sin, is you need to understand that it's through the law. The law of God is going to tell you whether you are fully like, understanding the commandments and the laws of God that are written in your heart and in your mind. This is how you, you test it. You test it through the Word of God. And when you realize that you're, you're committing certain things and you enjoy it, and it doesn't upset you, and you're full of pride, and you don't want to face God, and you, want to, you don't want to be humble about it, then you're out of whack. You're out of whack. You need the, the, the Bible to show you where you're wrong, and you already know in your heart, but if, you, if, if, you're in, if you're not compatible in that sense, you really need the Word of God to show you what that sin is, okay? To just clear that up in your hearts and in your mind. But that's, that's basically my conclusion right now, guys. I just want you to understand it's a serious thing. Sin is serious. And I don't want to be one of these pastors that don't preach against sin. You know, there are a lot of churches and a lot of pastors that just do not preach against sin. Now, I'm preaching about sin in general, okay? And, and you know, people are left just thinking, well, I can just, you know, I'm, I'm just always right with God. And they don't see the hand of God in their lives. They don't see uh, people getting saved. They don't see uh, knowledge growing of the Bible. They don't see themselves doing anything in their local church. Because they think they're, they're fine. They think they're right. They think they're, they're part, they're fellowshipping with Jesus. And Jesus says, look, I've gotten, you're so far away from me. I, I'm really not fellowshipping with you. All of that work that you're doing is in vain. And I want you to really enjoy life. I want you to get a hold of those pleasures forevermore. You know, generally speaking, I'm pretty a happy person, generally speaking, right? Because I, I realize that the pleasures, are, you know, that's going to give you so much joy is just being right with God. Just always setting God at the right hand. And when I sin, I just got to say, God, I'm so sorry. I just got to bow my head and just say, Lord, I'm a pastor even. I should be setting a better example than this. And, you know, but the sin nature. And, and the Lord, hey, is willing to forgive you. He's willing to clean you of your feet and make them beautiful again to be able to do the works of God. And that's God's desire for you. But the first step, brethren, is for you to realize just how awful, how terrible sin is. So I hope, you know, this sermon brings that back into your minds. All right, let's pray.